call our order. This is the Town of Pittsburgh Board of Commissioners meeting for Monday, April 25th, 2016. I'd like to open the meeting tonight with a moment of silence <coughs> in memory of Max Carter, who, thought, excuse me, who was a former board member and um, just a tremendous person in the community. Kiwanis, uh, belonged to the Kiwanis, uh, was for many years an employee of the school system and he passed away last week. So if we could hold his memory and thought as we take our moment of silence for Max. taking care of my ill husband Keith and we lived on family land in a trailer south of town in the country. After Keith died, uh, I was alone in the country in a nice piece of property but living in a substandard housing. It was a very difficult time for me and my family. Fortunately, in December of 2015, I became aware of the new affordable community in Pittsburgh called Belmont Point. The community had 76 rental units that qualify for affordable housing or income-based housing. I applied in December to get a unit and I was very pleased to be accepted by the management company. In January, I moved into my new apartment. Since I've been there, I've seen all the units fill up and today I live in a very diverse community with folks from Siler City, Pittsburgh, Goldston, and all over Chatham County. The community is safe, my housing is healthy, and it's energy efficient. For example, my power bill went from $240 a month to $65 a month because of, for, because of the energy efficiency. And that means that I can spend the extra money on my housing, eating at Burley's, and enjoying the town of Pittsburgh, <laughs> which is wonderful. I'm well aware that everyone on the town board is in favor of affordable housing in Pittsburgh. From personal experience, I highly recommend doing another project like Belmont Point in the town with the Soltis Partners. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them, and you are more than welcome to stop over and take a tour from me personally of my unit and the community. Thank you. And thank you, Pam. <coughs> and I was pleased to be able to, um, <coughs> to take that tour, and, and thank you, Pam, for opening up your house. Yes. Yeah. It's a very impressive, very impressive uh, project. 
Heather Johnson is our next speaker. <laughs> Heather Johnson, I'm at 278 Hillsborough Street, and I come to you as a member of the Pittsburgh Business Association today uh, to um, apprise the board of some of our plans and our, our major plans. Um, the Pittsburgh Business Association is working to have two large events that anchor downtown Pittsburgh every year. We know that the Christmas tree lighting ended up being a very successful event, and, and we have some work to do on on that event. But the second is we'd like to do a 4th of July uh, style event. And this particular event, so those would be the two large events. We have an annual budget of between ten and $15,000, so we work very hard for Sunday, brings in a lot of revenue for the Pittsburgh Business Association. Our membership has grown from 10 or 20 members to we have almost 70 members right now, so we are bringing in revenue that way. And we've dedicated those funds to um, anchoring downtown Pittsburgh. So the reason I'm coming to you today is because we are committing a, a budget of $5,500 for Pittsburgh Summer Fest. Small Town Big Fun. That's that's our event, and it's July 3rd. We've been working very hard with um, Mr. Grusbeck and Chief Crutchfield, and um, and Chatham Park has actually uh, committed $1,500 to sponsor our event stage. So it will be the Chatham Park concert stage, where big time our local band will play. Um, we're looking to close downtown Hillsborough, right in front of the circle up to Thompson. We can get into some of those weeds later, but um, as for not weeds, but details, um, our current sort of issue is that we are, are going to be working more with Mr. Grusbeck on security, and we've committed to pay officers over time at um, for, we've committed $2,520 um, to pay for these officers, um, but we really need to make up three hours time, and that's about $1,100. And we're hoping that the town would find those funds maybe, you know, coming to you from an approach of security is really where we're coming. We, we're going to cover everything else, but um, we feel like we could get officers even from surrounding areas if we couldn't get them here. And, you know, I know we can't have that discussion now, but we are on a time crunch, and I hope that we can talk with you a little bit more about it. Our emergency is not your emergency, but most importantly, we want you to know that these are our two main events. We're already working on firming up the details for um, holidays for this um, Christmas. Season and um, that's really what I've come to talk to you about. So hopefully, do you have any questions about it? I guess we can deal with it later. Okay. I'm glad that you're doing a Fourth of July. It feels like there's not really anything to do right here. In the there's nothing in our area on that day, and we want people to keep coming. We want we're going to encourage people to stay in Pittsburgh and play in Pittsburgh over the Fourth of July and shop. Can you just uh, announce to the board there's a, there's a groundbreaking coming up too, too, that you were telling me about? Right. Is Leslie <coughs> Oakley here? Leslie, um, so Leslie is on our committee and she was the next person. Leslie, too. Oh, okay. That's right. Come up for a minute. She's the next person on the on the thing. But yes, our church is, our, our church is, thank you, yes. Um, Leslie, would you come up and speak up? <laughs> she was next on the agenda. Yes. This is Sister Oakley that. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for giving me a second. I'm Leslie Oakley. Um, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I am the um, public affairs representative in the Pittsburgh area. And um, we do have um, much anticipated groundbreaking coming up for a new building. Right now we're located just... Um, we're just across down the road from 
the Hardys were in a little rented office space, so we're very excited for a new building, and that's going to be coming. Um, actually, the groundbreaking ceremony is this Saturday, April 30th at 10 a.m., um, and we would love it if you can come. I have some invites here I'd like to pass out, and then after the groundbreaking, we're hoping um, to get started with the clearing early May, and then we're promised in the 360 days from then we'll have our new building, so we're very excited about that. Um, we will have uh, our area leader there. His name is uh, Steve Bodain, and he is over eight congregations in um, Chatham County and also in western, well, let's see, in the Apex area. So he's, he's over um, the congregations there, and he'll be speaking as well there at the groundbreaking ceremony. So um, we're thankful for all who can come. I have some extra handouts I'll put here on the back table, and if I may, I'd like to... Can I hand bring some to you? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to being with you this Saturday. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Is there anyone that would like to make public comment and is not signed up? not, then we'll proceed to the next matter on the agenda, which is uh, mayor updates. I have um, been bringing to the board the number of interesting meetings that I've been to since the last board meeting, and, um, and since that last meeting, I've attended a joint DOT and Downtown Business Association meeting. Uh, I spoke at Kiwanis. I had the pleasure of, of meeting the Chatham County Utility Linesman on the Monday morning at 7.30 at the Duke Energy um, building here in Chatham County to wish them um, happy Linesman Day, which we did a proclamation for at the last meeting. Um, on the 19th, I went to the Pittsburgh Business Association meeting on the 22nd, an infrastructure meeting for the Economic Development Commission, and over the weekend, uh, a social event, but it was one that merits it uh, mentioned that the Timmy Lynn um, uh, Agency for Developmental Disabilities, um, and I think we'll be hearing more from that organization very shortly. Are there other meetings that the commissioners have been to that they'd like to report on? Going on the uh, Pittsburgh Business Association and Commissioner, elected official uh, social, so several of us were there. I attended the Channel Conservation Partnership presentation by a herpetologist from the North Carolina Museum of Natural History and learned about the 16 species of frogs that are here in Chatham County and went on a field trip in White Park. That was really um, I also had the pleasure of traveling around to several schools in Chatham County today and meeting uh, some of the recent award-winning authors who, uh, through the Chatham Young Authors Program. And uh, so that was really great to meet these, these kids who are Anyone else? Let me just make mention of some upcoming meetings. Um, and Matt is here and he'll talk, I'm sure, about these events. But uh, the next TARPO meeting is the 19th. Matt, I don't know the location. That is it's here. Okay. It'll be at the, uh, the Ag Building. Okay. So that's on the 19th. And there's a public presentation in the Dunlop building of the SIP um, um, projects on the 18th at 6 p.m., 7.30 p.m. Uh, the next downtown PBA uh, meeting is the 11th, 9 a.m. at the Roadhouse, as usual. And the next Main Street uh, meeting is Wednesday, May 4th, uh, here in this room from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. I actually have a meeting on Wednesday, trying with Jake Council of Government. I am the immediate past chair, so basically we will be not placing in nominations for the new chair upcoming in August, and I am the person that is the chairperson of that particular committee, so I will be attending that on Wednesday, the usual thing at trying with JRTP.
right, then let's move to the next item, which is the public hearing for the rezoning of 68 Fayetteville Street. Is there a motion by the board to go into public hearing? So moved. Moved by Mr. Fierko, seconded by Jay Farrell. Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. The motion carries. Good evening, Jeff Jones. How are you? I'm, I'm well. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Board, for having me tonight. We do have a rezoning as REZ 2016-01. The applicant is John Justice. Its um, location is two parcels, uh, generally located at 68 Fayetteville Street. Current um, existing land use is residential. There is a home on at 68 Fayetteville Street, and then there's a vacant piece of property adjacent to that. Both uh, those parcels are zoned R12. The applicant is wishing to go to a commercial zoning, which is C2. Um, C2 is generally in the area. The parcel north, which is owned by the applicant, is C2 CU. Um, south uh, of the two parcels here is a corner piece, and that's owned R12, and that's owned by the uh, Pittsburgh uh, United Methodist Church. And we have west. We have two parcels. One is on R12 and one is on C2. The C2 has a home on it that has been converted to an office, much like what the applicant is wishing to do with the home at 68th Street. And to the east the C4. You move uh, across the street on Fable Street, you move into what we call the downtown zoning district, which is C4, and that is the Pittsburgh United Methodist Church property. The property has been zoned R12 since early 90s, as best I can, I can tell. Um, the future land use for the area has, uh, it's designated for mixed use town center which includes uh, categories of central business district of Pittsburgh and its surrounding adjacent blocks, setbacks, and on-site parking requirements are general, generally minimal. Um, mix of uses include both businesses and residential um, uh, projects in the area. Uh, and infill development as, as development uh, occurs. And key for the last one is adaptive reuse of existing buildings. Um, the C2 is, a, is defined as a primarily designed for major highways that run through the city um, and major arterial highways. Uh, this district is intended to provide retail, office, and services uh, that benefit the residential areas nearby and then the non-residential areas as well. Uh, this district accommodates intensive commercial uses such as shopping centers, strip centers, as well as freestanding or highway-oriented business establishments. Um, the property is served by public utilities. Uh, water and sewer are available to the property. Uh, with this being uh, converting from a residential nature uh, home to potential commercial, population change would actually be negative, so we would uh, not, not have a population change of more residential uses in the area. And transportation patterns for currently what's there, not future. Um, there's no transportation changes in that pattern. Um, tonight we're holding a public hearing to hear from the public and possibly the applicant. I'm not sure if he's here. Maybe yeah, John's here. Um, to uh, hold the public hearing and to hear from the public uh, and the applicant. And the request is to uh, recommend that this go to the plan board next week. And then the plan board will give you their recommendation uh, next week. And then the following week it will come back to you for action. I will note that there is no one signed up for this public hearing. However, uh, is there anyone that would like to speak to this issue, including Mr. Justice? I consider it very straightforward. All right. I, I might say something. Um, I, my family and I worship across the street. It's a United Methodist Church, and so I took a little curiosity in this project and spoke with Mr. Justice about it. Um, and the church has significant plans in the future, a very grand, bold vision for growth. Um, it does not involve that particular property. Um, and I, I can't see any way in which that would conflict 
or that it might conflict with um, adjacent uh, residents um, because there's similar uses already in play with um, other properties nearby. Um, and uh, I, I'm in favor of it, but I, I recognize that we still need to hear from the planning board, and I'm, I'm eager to hear what they have to say. Other comments or questions by the planner or the applicant? A couple of observations. Um, Jeff, um, if, we, if, if this is successful rezoning, that will uh, preclude this property from being used as a residence? It will. Okay. Yes. So that's not Currently, the home use. has not been used uh, within the last six months or so as a home, um, and the intent from the applicant, from what I understand, is to convert that to a commercial space. Okay. And then let's say that that commercial establishment were to leave, um, that would preclude the home from then being used as a residential use in the future and, and the, um, the applicant is aware of that. And you know I like the idea of the adaptive reuse but in the rezoning there's there's no obligation, there's no school. There is not. Right. So that may or may not be the way it plays out but so it's a good idea for certain. For certain. Um, when you say sewer utilities are available to the property, is the property served with public sewer? I think the home is, is currently with the public sewer, yeah. Mr. Justice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And what would be the equivalent um, zoning district in the UDO to C2? Thanks for that. Um, is it the neighborhood? I think neighborhood is going to be where I'm going to focus this particular property on um, moving forward and we're going to have a whole um, exercise on trying to take all these C2 uses and parcels uh, because that seems to be the zoning of choice <coughs> over the years and try to really find out which one is more neighborhood commercial and one's, which one's more mixed use uh, commercial center which is going to be more highway. Um, I think if we had the UDO in play right now, I would have went to neighborhood commercial activity center and not, not a highway commercial. Great. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Further questions or comments? <coughs> if there are none, is there a motion to go out of public hearing and place this matter on the agenda for the planning board next Monday? Yes. So moved. Second. Moved by Pamela Baldwin, seconded by Michael Fioco. Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. <laughs> Under new business on our agenda, our first matter is a presentation from EcoCP Partners, LLC. And um, I believe that Kurt Bradley and John Fugo are with us tonight. And we look forward to hearing. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, uh, as y'all know, since the inception of Chatham Park, finding the right partner to do our commercial side uh, shopping center has been uh, has been a task. And uh, fortunately, between Kurt Bradley, who I've known over 35 years, and John Fugo, they have made it really easy for us. We've probably had eight or ten companies across the uh, country that have shown interest in joining forces with us on doing a shopping center. First 45 acres that we're going to develop with these gentlemen uh, is the piece that the count had. I think at one time it was the Briar Creek Shopping Center developer and I think it came before a previous board and I believe was approved for shopping center. It is our most northern piece on 15501 and uh, so many times sitting in sessions, hey, we like what's going on up in Chapel Hill, and we like Southern Village, and we like this, and we like that. So we said, heck, the best way to fix that is to go get the people that did that, who we know, and we know they do quality projects, and they're more local than most of us in this room almost. I mean, they are, they're local folks. We're, we're proud to, uh, to announce that we have engaged with them in a letter to go forward with developing our shopping center on that first phase. So what I'll do now is I'll, and not only are they shopping center developers, they are community developers. Kirk Bradley, who I'll introduce first, uh, is very engaged in the Lee and Chatham County education movement. 
He also is involved in the Northwoods High School. So, Kurt, without further ado, I'll introduce you to the commissioners here. Kirk Bradley, and uh, I uh, live, uh, uh, live just right up the road and uh, have been working in Chatham County for a number of years. Uh, the project that I've been involved with, that most of you probably are familiar with, is Governor's Club. Uh, my family developed it. Uh, our company is based in Sanford, North Carolina, so on the other end, I pass through Pittsburgh quite often and stop quite often as well, the Blue Dot and other places. But, um, John and I have been partners for a number of years, and uh, I'll introduce our teammates, and then I'll let uh, John do the presentation, tell you a little bit about himself. Um, uh, Kevin Hine is the CFO of Lemore Capital Company. Um, Lenny Causey has just joined us and has uh, over 30 years as a real estate attorney. And then uh, John uh, Fugo is my partner. He has a company, Montgomery Carolina Developments, a general contractor. Uh, but we started about eight years ago to develop projects together. Uh, the two, two of those uh, that you probably have seen uh, are the West Point development near South Point Mall in Durham where the Bonefish Grill is. And then also uh, John has put together recently the uh, Briar Chapel commercial right near the entrance there. So I'll let John uh, go through our presentation here. Which one did you get? Go ahead and start. There you go. I was going to go back to the front. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Councilors, or Commissioners. Thank you for having us. Um, as Bubba said, we have been talking for several months about the possibility of joining forces with Shannon Park and working as the commercial developer in the early phases of the commercial areas. Our experience, uh, just click this and we'll move, okay. Uh, we are first off going to develop the uh, 44 acre parcel that is north of the Bojangles former trailer park site. And um, going back to um, our experience recently, that's our development, West Point at 751, right off I-40 uh, and 751. We developed the, uh, the Bonefish Grill, uh, an Aldi supermarket, a retail building with a town hall burger and beer, and a 30,000 foot office building, which is where our, our offices are. Um, Our company, Montgomery, is as we call ourselves, we have two companies. We have a national general contracting company, which we started in 1986. My wife and I own it. My wife's Christine Edwards. She's the president of that company. We built retail projects and office projects in 38 states. We continue to work nationally, and we work for primarily retail clients. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, national retailers that you've seen in the malls. We do freestanding buildings and large big box. We do a lot of work for Dick Sporting Goods. We've done uh, work for Talbot's Children's Place. Um, most of them, we probably did 15 stores in South Point Mall. And we continue to do that nationally. Our other company is Montgomery, Carolina, which is the real estate development company. And that's really the company that will be heading up the commercial development at Chatham Park. That company I'm the president of, Christine is vice president of. Uh, I'm a real estate broker as well as the licensed general contractor, and I hold all the licenses for the general contracting company in the United States. Years of tests and continuing education, which I still do. Um, currently, you're probably aware of the uh, commercial area of Briar Chapel. 
which we are developing. Our company is building those uh, buildings right now. They're scheduled to be open in October. Four buildings, uh, all of them are 100% leased. So we're, um, we're going to build that. We, we will stay and manage, uh, which we typically do. We handle the design, we handle the construction, and then we do the leasing and the management. So we'll manage uh, Prior Chapel's buildings after they're completed. Most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Southern Village. Uh, in 1996, we formed a partnership with D.R. Bryan, who developed Southern Village. And our role in the development was to handle the downtown. And our company handled the, the uh, planning, hiring the architects. We built the buildings. We managed them. We leased them. Uh, and we did that for 14 years. After that, we turned it over to DR's company, and now Bryan Properties manages the commercial downtown of Southern Village. We still own the buildings with DR. I live in Southern Village, um, but, but our job there is done. Briar Chapel is 100% leased. Our job there, at least that part of it is done. The construction and the management will continue. And now our focus is Chatham Park. So we plan on, I mean, I don't want to say I'm going to dedicate every day 100%, but my mind is working that way. And when, when we move into a project, we dedicate almost all of our forces to it, and we focus on it every day and work it hard. That's how we ended up getting 100% lease at Briar Chapel. And you know, hard work, luck, being in the right place at the right time. Uh, but we we are very focused on our tenants prospering, working with the municipality. And in this particular case with Chatham Park, we're very conscious of the effect that we might have on the downtown. And we plan on keeping that in the forefront of our thinking as we develop the 44-acre parcel to make sure that what we do complements downtown and works with it, does not take anything away from it. It's one of the, in, in my travels in retail construction and commercial construction around the country, downtown Pittsburgh is a rarity in that everything's occupied and it actually has life. And I've seen numerous dead towns uh, that look like that and, and have seen development move away and highways move away and, and, and I can tell you that we've discussed that with the Chatham Park developers everybody's conscious of it as we go forward so we plan on having uh, as much cooperation with those tenants and speaking with them as we can we uh, we deal very openly we'll answer questions we'll, our office is open to anyone who wants to come over, see plans, see what we're doing, see what we're thinking. Um, so we look forward to a successful project here and, and continuing on with Chatham Park development. And, and we're available to answer questions for anyone. Oh, I didn't finish it, did I? Sorry. Another picture of Southern Village. This is um, Symphony Night which uh, has been a huge success for us. And uh, that will continue. All of the events there will continue. I'm also conscious of not affecting Southern Village, which is kind of an interesting dilemma I have. You know, in Briar Chapel, I, I, uh, I put four restaurants at Briar Chapel, and uh, none of my tenants in Southern Village got upset. So they all know each other. Hopefully what we do here in Chatham Park will not upset anybody else, especially my partner. So uh, just to describe the development company, um, Kirk's company, Lemore Capital, has partnered up with Montgomery, and, and we are the managing members of the uh, ECHO group, which is the development entity that will develop Chatham Park.
Uh, some of sorry, Kirkus. Rather, you spoke about your company. Thank you, John, and I'll I'll wrap this up so we can take questions. But um, I think uh, John's combination of experience and mine, uh, being local, uh, being in a town like Sanford, we understand the importance of downtown districts and and working with them. I think if we're successful in what we envision, uh, that it will help all the businesses in Pittsburgh do better because they'll bring more traffic south and west from other uh, population centers in the Triangle. Uh, we've been involved in a lot of different uh, commercial sectors. This is my office building. Uh, this used to be a service station. Uh, we've built a nice building that uh, we think enhances the downtown area of Sanford. Um, Point it over here. Oh, yeah. I mentioned San, uh, Governor's Club. As you know, Governor's Club is more than the gated community. We have a commercial core there as well and several other neighborhoods that are developed with sidewalks and front porch uh, uh, homes. So we uh, are very uh, familiar with that type of development, which I think is part of what is going to be one of the hallmarks of, of Chatham Park and their residential area. also want to know that uh, uh, I've been very involved in both the Chatham Economic Development uh, Corporation for the last eight years. I've been an investor in that and I also spearheaded the development. You may have heard of the Central Carolina Works Project where we raised seed capital so that Central Carolina Community College could hire nine um, career readiness counsel counselors that they put into the nine public high schools in Chatham, Hornet, and Lee County to help uh, those students and their families understand about the Career and College Promise program that the state pays for that allows students that were in the uh, junior and senior year in high school to take community college and earn up to a year's worth of uh, college or technical certificate credit before they graduate for free. I'm also a member of the uh, Chatham Public Education uh, Ambassador as well. That. Introduce the team members. I think that's it. So we uh, we're a well-financed group. We've got a lot of experience, and we're excited to be a part of uh, working with uh, Tim and Bubba and the Chatham investors, uh, all Chatham Park investors, and, and bringing the commercial areas to reality. So John and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Board any questions for Kirk Bradley? I have one. Several can't get them all out. Um, you, you mentioned the uh, aspect of town of Pittsburgh as a business owner. There, what what ideas are you headed to uh, to help downtown Pittsburgh enhance our downtown area? What direction are you headed? I guess more or less. I'll take it. <laughs> we don't have a direction yet. We need to speak with them and understand uh, more about what they need and how we can work with them in a productive manner. We made this agreement a week ago and we really did not want to do anything until we had this meeting. So you knew who we were before we started talking to people and had you hear it from the outside. So we plan on doing this and then getting out there and mixing it up, understanding. So I don't have an answer for you right now, but I will. Fair enough. Yeah. I'm curious about some of the technical aspects of the Southern Village downtown section. How many acres is that in that single ring? 17. 17. How many tenants do you have there? How many commercial tenants? Um, I count them in my head, but I want to say we've got 17 or 18. Okay. We've got a couple large ones, you know, a couple 30,000 footers that take up a lot of space. Mm -hmm. How many residential units are in that area? 1,178. In that circle? Oh, not in the circle. That's, a, that's the yeah. entire development. Okay. There are 330 apartments. 
and I want to say about a hundred condos and townhomes and the rest are single-family homes but there's 1178 in Southern Village. Mm -hmm. How many acres is the uh, park downtown? The uh, center where the yeah. symphony plays? It's yeah. one acre. It's one acre. It's one acre. Okay. Put 3,000 people on it. Other questions from the board? The board wants to open it up for questions from the public. Sure. Gentleman in the blue shirt. Yes. Uh, do you foresee that the area that you're developing north of Pittsburgh to be similar to what Southern Village is, or is that a total new design? It'll be similar but different. Um, we learned a lot in Southern Village. Um, and what we have learned is that the buildings are very important, but the environment outside the buildings is just as important. So we're, we're not only going to focus on the building design, but what we do with the grounds and the environment and, and, and how um, people will be able to come and gather and stay and you know, in Southern Village, we have the one acre in the center, which is really where everybody gathers. Um, but we learned that we could have done a better job, and now we're systematically going around and trying to fix that. Um, but, you know, we just learned a lot. So it'll be vibrant. Would you, would you uh, <coughs> in that 45 acres you're talking about there that's north of Bojangles, would you... Uh, would that be mixed residential as well as commercial and you know restaurants and that's, that, that's the, the plan or like you have up there yeah, yeah. That, that, that's the plan I mean we have store. 17 acres in Southern Village we've got 44 here so we're yeah. expecting we can do you know a better bigger job and um, do a better job with the uh, public areas you know lay them out a little differently so uh, accommodate parking a little better than we do there. That type of thing. But yeah, ideally, you know, good mix. So there's life all the time. Residences at night keeps the commercial area secure. It's kind of like autom automatic security. So. What would you like to see happen in downtown? The existing downtown. I don't know. I don't know. I, I would say that um, my initial look at downtown is that the um, outside, the businesses are, are great, the, at least the ones I've been in uh, and are eaten in, uh, but the sidewalk is, is a problem. And, you know, if that could be fixed to where it could be more conducive to the public, um, you know, and it's it's a tough one because the road's there. And there's only so much room to work with, but um, bringing the businesses more outside of their <coughs> space, that's an answer. That's all I can give you right now. Would you be open to negotiating um, types of things that you build versus what might be of interest to downtown? Um, I'm not sure. Well, I'm, I'm thinking that well, I'd love to see a situation where the old town was the default location for things that served this whole area. Not been put on the table, not been discussed, but mm -hmm. just my notion of what would be a real nice arrangement. Um, so that makes sense. Uh, the only the only issue I would see with that is that it's a it's a it's limited by its own size. So there would be, there would come a time when everything else would outgrow it. But if it could be established early on to do what you're saying, then it would sustain. We're happy to sit down. I think that's part of our process. Yeah. We want to get started and maybe understand a little bit more what you're thinking and how that would work together. It's an interesting it's thought. Though. That you get the feedback from our commissioners, but mm -hmm. uh, surely within the community, there's got to be some 
desires. Sure. Uh, I'll say one thing in the experience that I've seen in Sanford and other downtowns is that unfortunately we all like historic buildings and want to keep those forms and it doesn't lend itself to certain uses that work better in a greenfield circumstance. So I would hope that they would wind up being at the end of the day very complementary with each other that there's things that really work better in the existing historic downtown that couldn't, that, that, and so, and we figure those out and try and work cooperatively. I mean, that's the, we just need to understand a little bit more what uh, the town's looking for and, and, and individuals as well for them, their citizens. I think Commissioner Michael Fiocco and I uh, toured the downtown of Sanford with your mayor not long ago and were very, very impressed, especially with the historic renovation of the building there on is it Steel Street? Uh, uh, Chatham Street, the Chatham. buggy factory. That we put yes. all the, uh, with all the planning and zoning and, and infrastructure uh, offices in there, that was just a magnificent, absolutely beautiful uh, concept. And I think that what Sean Justice is saying is that it would be wonderful to be able to have a sense of coordination between us so that there's not duplication of effort and that there is, um, to the extent that can be done, the preservation of the uniqueness of Pittsburgh, the eclecticness of Pittsburgh, which obviously is one of the reasons you you all came here to start with. So. Absolutely. That will be easy to do. We'll be glad to do it. That's, that's why I think uh, Tim and Bubba picked us. Uh, they wanted someone that had a little more sensitivity to that. and. You know, the other thing is, we live here now, we plan to live here later, and so we want to do something that everybody, to the extent possible, is happy with and, and work to make things um, enhance what's already there. So we'll work hard on that. Well, I'm happy to hear you identify the sidewalks as an issue and recognize that. Uh, something we are thinking about as well. It is included in our downtown vision plan. You may want to take a look at that. And, uh, and then think on that, because one of the things we're doing with the NCDOT is trying to get funding for the improvements. Um, and specifically right now, we're trying to get funding from them simply to do a survey so that we could have something in hand that we could decide from. Uh, so glad to see you recognize that as a need. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask, and I think the gentleman in the audience asked it, um, was it, are you looking to have a grocery store in your property in 44 acres. We are, okay. um, and, and we intend on, you know, beginning discussions with several grocers after tonight. Okay, thank you. Other questions from the board? Commissioner Fiocco, you had a question? Let me bring up one other, one other thing that was important when we started our dialogue with Kurt and John is that a hotel was really paramount on our list of the things we wanted. They developed the Hyatt Hotel over there across from 751. And yes, a hotel is in the initial plans of what we're doing. So the shopping center section itself would house a hotel component. Hotels right now don't model out well as far as the economics. The reason is not one here now. But when you put the mass of a shopping area and services close by, the hotels then start saying, hey, now we have a reason to be here. So that was really one of the primary things. They didn't want to get ahead of these guys' big announcements, but a hotel is not done, but a hotel is very much in the mix, and it's one of the things that we'll be working with John and Kurt on in the, in the coming months to house a, a site that would have interconnectivity with all of the shopping and restaurants and other services that would be available. Also, one other thing, before they wanted to get started, they wanted to meet the staff, so they have already met with Brian and both Jeff, and they, they insisted on coming to meet with you guys tonight, which is why we like them. And I, we had firms out of Atlanta, we had people from Dallas, everybody wants to come in and do, you know, the big project. It's a neighborhood program, so we're going to take it easy, and we're going to do it with folks that know how to do it and understand the culture of this region and live here. So I want to bring up the hotel, because I know that's something everybody's excited about. Thank you, Bubba. And, and I'd like to encourage y'all, Bubba, I appreciate that point, uh, encourage y'all to touch base with the larger nonprofits in the community uh, because there is a real um, uh, need for that lodging 
and um, the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association in particular uh, holds an annual gathering, um, 700,000 people, um, and I'm not sure that they could do it here in town, but I know that they've wanted to for a long, long time. And there are other organizations that would also like to do large gatherings. I know that's one area that I feel that we lose a lot of income is, is people travel to uh, Chapel Hill for hotels when there's a need to have a place. I feel like we lose a lot of revenue. Mm -hmm. Like at Farrington, there's, there's multiple weddings a weekend and they're bumping people in from hotels to Chapel Hill. I don't think coming to I'm, I'm really encouraged to hear that you all are someone local that has that in mind small town atmosphere, the village atmosphere, which you've done in Southern Village, I think that's very nice. I like the South Point, all of those areas that you've mentioned, I'm very familiar with those, and I do feel encouraged that you all will consider downtown with every effort to make sure that it's not one where everything goes out and not enhance our downtown, which is really important. And the idea of a hotel, I mean, that couldn't be more timely because everyone has been asking for that for years and years. And so basically, I'm really encouraged that you all are <coughs> considering all of that. You're going to meet with the downtown merchants and talk with them about things and what they anticipate from you all and exchange ideas. I'm very encouraged about that. Your bike plan is going to be a part of this development as well? Our connectivity, I know that there's part of the plan with Chatham Park is to have I think, and everything. yeah, I think that pretty much would have to happen. And the retailers want that now. I mean, that's actually part of the whole retail mentality is the connectivity. Yeah. We'll talk about the bike right away, Talking about Chatham Park. <laughs> <laughs> Are there further questions? I, I do have some questions. I, I'm mindful uh, and, and, and appreciate, uh, Mr. Fugo, that you, you've emphasized that you haven't had these conversations that you really want to have with local folks, and so your plans are uh, in flux. But um, I'm curious to what extent you've thought about uh, density. And um, I think somebody mentioned the mixed uh, commercial and residential. Well, we've got approval for 250,000 feet, give or take, on that site. And, and we don't intend on exceeding that unless, you know, a mixture comes in uh, that, that is just a must-have in that equation and it works with the parking. Um, but as far as the density, um, so I don't know. I, I don't think I can answer that for you yet. Other than it needs to feel. I don't want to use the word intimate, but it needs to have that feeling. It needs to feel comfortable, and it needs to be well lit and not spread out, um, which means some underbuilding parking. Um, that type of we we don't. Um, we don't plan on looking at aerial photos of Fields Blacktop. So, um, we want it more urban, less suburban strips, and we don't want that. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, I'm, I'm not answering your questions no. clearly, but I'm telling you what I'm feeling right now. I respect that. Um, and, and, and I really want to encourage those conversations to unfold. Um, and, and that collaboration to proceed. I, I'm very excited about this partnership. Um, the success of Governor's Club is reassuring. Uh, the Southern Village, Market Street, and the, the new commercial developments there at the veranda, they're impressive, they're attractive. Um, Southern Village is a great place to spend money. And you know, I'm, I'm very excited about what I've read about the veranda. Um, and I, I really admire the hard work that I imagine goes into that kind of development. Um, 
that brings together such a diverse and successful array of locally owned businesses. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest with you, I find that much more impressive than the typical, what I perceive to be lower risk, lower reward style of development filled with Walmarts or mega groceries or otherwise, I'll call them undistinguished local chains or national chains, undistinguished national chains. And I feel rather strongly about this, the emphasis on local ownership. Um, and the data from studies that I've read show that these locally owned businesses return so much more to our local economy in terms of wealth to the community. Um, and so I'd really like to encourage you to reach for the stars here in, in Pittsburgh. We've got tremendous talent, skills, creativity, and um, I feel pent-up demand for unusual commerce here in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And Chatham County and the broader Piedmont. So I just really want to let you know that if you want to do things differently as you've done in Southern Village and Brown, I'm eager to work with you. Well, thank you. I can tell you um, the locally owned businesses, um, in, in our opinion, only succeed if you give them the right building and the right environment. If you put them in a strip center block building with no personality, <coughs> excuse me, and people won't want to even turn off the highway to go to them, they're not going to succeed. So we decided to spend the money to do nice buildings, to create a place where people want to go. Um, because when you're dealing with these locals, even, even when it's their second or third location, there's still a lot of fear, there's still a lot of anxiety, and, and it's not just about how uh, inexpensively you can put up the building and get them to sign the lease. You really got to look at it uh, long term. And uh, the one thing that we don't want to happen is we don't want any spaces going dark because that doesn't help us at all or anybody. So um, I, I, I hear you. They, they will show up and um, They'll, I mean, we've done plans and, and we've had them fail at the last minute just because they couldn't do it. And then the next one could. So um, it, it'll happen here. Yeah, I appreciate that. It may very well be higher risk. I recognize that. It's, it's going to be a risk and it's going to be up to us to mitigate it with what we put them in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just one comment. We did just sign this letter of intent two weeks ago, <laughs> and uh, yeah. we've, since that time we've met with the public staff and now with y'all. So we want to meet with the downtown uh, Pittsburgh Business Associate and everybody, but give us you know 30 or 45 to 60 days to kind of get organized so we have a, a framework to do that in. So I just want didn't want everybody. We haven't. We're just getting started, and so we do plan to meet with everybody, but we need a little bit of time before we're ready to do so. So please uh, bear with us. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. The next matter on the agenda is consideration of the straight state transportation improvement projects. Jeff Jones. Thank you, Mayor Board. We'll pivot a little bit from land use and go to tra future transportation projects in the county and in the town. This is a project uh, that's been ongoing for several years, and specifically this set of projects uh, within the last uh, six to eight months. Um, this is our uh, transportation improvement project, 4.0, so it's the fourth rendition of, of projects that the uh, Trans uh, Triangle Area Rural Planning Organization, TARPO, um, has put together um, along with county staff and Tyler City. Um, essentially, in, in the staff report, I gave you a, a list of um, 
the schedule for the implementation of, of prioritization 4.0, and we're at the bolded uh, bullet point, which is each county or municipality will approve a ranked list of top 10 projects and submit that to TARPO. Um, and we're in that late March, early April uh, time frame. We, we thought we were going to be able to come a little bit earlier to you in that late March time frame, but the state uh, withheld their ranking system uh, from, from TARPO for a number of weeks, so we're a little behind schedule a little bit. Uh, next will be to um, have, so tonight we're, we're asking you to look at the list that the towns and the county put together along with TARPO and endorse that list of projects then we'll uh, meet, uh, we'll have a public meeting as uh, Commissioner Fioco pointed out on the 18th uh, for the public to be able to come and voice their opinion. We'll then have a, uh, a PARPA meeting on the 19th to, uh, to further go over those, uh, those scores. Um, so how do we get to where we are today? Um, Again, back in the summer time frame, TARPO along with the towns and the county put together a, a working list of projects uh, that would be submitted to DOT for scoring. Uh, those projects, um, um, most of them carried over from projects in the past uh, that were not funded in 3.0 or other, other funding cycles. Um, and then there was an opportunity to put forth uh, additional projects for consideration. The, and, and I have Matt here from TARPO, he can help if I get off track here. Um, those projects were um, put to DOT and um, in the late 2015 time, time frame and we got those rankings back within the last few months, few weeks. Um, there were 12 projects initially that, that, was, that were ranked by uh, DOT. Uh, the top 10 projects are what we're asking you all to endorse. And our methodology for um, the county and the towns as we got together of how the, the municipalities and the county would rank the, uh, the projects would be to essentially take the ranking system from DOT and let that be our guide. In the staff report, you can see that there was a, uh, a top 10 list that came, uh, that came together uh, from the ranking system that essentially had uh, Siler City's airport runway extension number one, all the way down to number 10, which was uh, bike lanes on Hamlet's Chapel and Jones Ferry. Um, Chapman County pulled a, the number four project from their list, which was, uh, let's see, I want to say the interchange uh, at 64 and 751. That, that project did not go through their normal public uh, process of going to their um, transportation committee. So they pulled that all together. And essentially what happened once they pulled that project off and another project that was funded from a different cycle, we were left with 10 projects because uh, we were moved to the one and one moved to a different funding cycle or funding program. Um, we were left with the top 10 that are under, under consideration tonight. One being Siler City's airport runway extension all the way down to 87 modernization improvements. There are a couple of particular projects that are uh, of importance to Pittsburgh, which is number six, which is the Pittsburgh uh, Moncure Road modernization improvements, and that number 10, uh, 87 modernization improvements. Um, these are the, these are the the projects that are before you for consideration. Again, Siler City and the and the county have both held their uh, public meeting or their meetings with their boards to in, get endorsements, and those two boards have endorsed the projects so far. Um, 
I'm going to try to field or answer any questions that you have, um, and Matt can help me answer those. But uh, I'm here to, to sort of guide us through this process. This is something that, again, this is the fourth rendition. Stuart came, came to, the, to this board a couple of years ago asking for an endorsement of similar projects. The, the, the way, the mechanism for the projects getting ranked was is different now. And, and if we get into to how that's different, Matt will be able to help me with that because he was he was integral in, in both processes. But uh, we can certainly explain the differences between 3.0 and 4.0 if, if we need to. Questions from the board? Yeah, I have one. Uh, GF on the uh, number eight improvements to the Sanford Road in Pittsburgh, is that considered from the uh, courthouse circle? I can't remember, Matt. Do you know which? I believe it is from, there's a, there's a spot down there where it goes over a creek. Uh -huh. It's from that south down to uh, where 87 ties it. And that's a three lane. Is that? Yeah. Right. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Three lane, four lane, three lane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I forgot to mention that, that project as well. And um, number 10, that's very high on my list. Does everyone know that I've been pushing for that truck route? Yeah. Um, what do we need to do to move number 10 up? Well, I'd like to endorse that as well um, because I think it's a uh, corollary to the downtown vision plan. And, um, there's a lot of concerns about trying to get truck traffic out of downtown, and trying to make improvements to downtown. This would be a perfect opportunity to I think marry Matt these two. can give us a, a better explanation of how, how these were ranked and why 87 is number 10 and then kind of maybe go from how do we get it moved up. If, if we can. So I'll turn it over. Let's focus on that ladder part. The so low on the list. I was thinking about a bunch of the top five, but how come we don't worry at the bottom? So the kind of going back to what Jeff said earlier, the list, the ranked list that was put together here and is presented to you was based entirely on how DOT scored them. So we just put them in the same order that those DOT scores came out. And I can tell you out of the 50 projects we had in the whole RPO area, that 87 project came in dead last. 50th. 50th. So, yes, we could rank it higher. Ranking it higher could mean that the RPO could put points on it, but I'm here to tell you today, even if the RPO did put points on it, because the way this works is a certain part of the score is based on DOT score, and then there's another piece of the final score based on how the RPO gives points. Um, even if we put as many points on it as possible, it still would not be enough to, to get over that hump of, of scoring so badly on the DOT points. So, I think in terms of how to, to deal with NC87, there's sort of two things here. Um, one is there's the idea about making that the signed truck route. So one sort of alternative to look at is, is it possible to sign that as a truck route without making physical improvements to the road? Is that even a possibility? And I don't know if you've had that conversation with DOT yet or not. I, I'm not privy to, to what's been discussed, but the other side of that, as far as the physical improvements, our next opportunity to try to make that happen would be in another two years. Well, really in another year when we get ready to submit our project list for the next round of this for 5.0. And I think at that point in time, we could look at kind of narrowing down the scope of the project. I think if we can kind of limit the, the area we're looking at and the specific improvements we're looking at, we can reduce that cost and that will help it to score better next time around. Um, if you look at the description that's in there from this time, it's extending all the way from 902 all the way up to Alamance County. That's a very expensive project which contributes to the bad score. 
It seems like number six and number ten really could tie together because the Pittsburgh Montreal Road, which is also US one, uh, it'd be easy to use that as a truck route going from US one seven fifty one over to eighty seven. Um, that's just a natural truck route. And I don't know if that's ever been presented that those two are sort of connected because of that potential for a truck route. Well, and part of the difficulty we run into is that DOT scoring uh, doesn't really take into account any of these sort of qualitative things. It's all data. It's all about congestion and, and crash statistics and stuff like that. So, so they're not interested in the vision plan is something that they're... As far as how the scoring happens, <laughs> no. yeah. I think it was an ink uh, score very highly in the congestion Category with the trucks and downtown. Um, but what does that get us? So, what does the fact that we have such congestion in downtown, what does that get us? Well, only improvements to the circle. It, two years ago, when we, when we went through this, it did actually get a project funded on Hillsborough Street to do a three lane widening section up there. So you can see how, you know, it kind of having the condition on that road did help your score in that case. But in this particular case, I think because of the length of the project and just it's probably too much to overcome the fact that you are getting some congestion benefit there. And, and where does that project stand? That project is funded, I want to say, in 2019-ish, somewhere around there. I'd, I'd have to look up. That was 18. Maybe 18. And that's the one from Chatham Mill North to 64. Yes. Now, is there any opportunity to reduce, to modify this project at this time? Um, unfortunately, at this time, it's, it's too late in the process. So, uh, really, our only opportunity is to wait and, and try again in the next cycle. <coughs> the good news is that we do this cycle every two years. So. Um, You know, I, I know that in the in the in the moment that sounds like a long time, but in the terms of how DOT functions, and we're actually looking ten years out in terms of funding, two years is is not that long. Well, strategically, do you do you find that we've got an adopted vision plan? Um, it it does encourage getting the trucks out of downtown. Um, this route has been used before when downtown. One of the trucks out because of construction activities. Um, can that help in our scoring? Did the DO, was, is that part of the data that DOT so reviews? That is not part of the data that is used. Um, and it, it gets into um, the data that DOT uses is all uh, sort of data that they can get consistently on a statewide basis. So it's things like traffic volumes and crash statistics and it's really hard to to take an issue like this and boil it into some sort of data point that the DOT can throw into their formula. Um, I think what you might want to think about in the short term, in the long, in, in in the two year cycle, yes, we we need to think about rescoping this and figuring out a better a way to get in a better score next time. Um, but in the short term, it, I think it's worth having that conversation with DOT. Is it possible to go ahead and sign that as a truck route without making improvements to it? We're going to need a truck route when we're doing improvements to the circle. If there's, there's the truck traffic is going to have to be rerouted when we're working on that, so there will have to be some sort of truck route. And that's going on. And I, I do know that one concern is the bridge out there. Um, that bridge is already slated for replacement in a few years, so that issue will already sort of work itself out. Near the park. Yeah. Robeson Creek. Over Robeson Creek. That's right. Which bridge? On the oh, oh, town. Sorry. Oh, town. Oh, that bridge. Oh. Well, I don't think it was long ago that uh, the DOT granted some right of way. The DOT for that I'm just wondering, um, I'm looking at the state, I haven't checked this, but 
Were these meetings held during a time when we did not have a planner? Is that why we're so low on the prices? <laughs> because we didn't have anybody go to the bathroom? It, uh, unfortunately, I, I think, think that is what happened. Yeah, I'm committed to, to being more involved. Um, and you can ask Matt. I'm more, I'm more involved on questions because I'm trying to catch, get up to speed on the whole transportation plan. Yeah, this is for And it's not in reference to this list, it's in reference to a previous list where, and I think, and that was approved from my understanding, the sidewalk could go from downtown all the way up to Powell Place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, the, that's the 2019 2019? Project. Yeah. I wonder if we added all the way up through to North Wood. That's Northwood. where I had requested it go to. Yeah. Um, so at this point in the process, no. But that's something we could submit as a project request next time. In the next cycle. So around the summer of next year, I'll be coming to you all and we'll be talking more about projects that we want to submit, just like that one and others that we see around town, sidewalks or congestion management or bike lanes or anything like that. Um, not uh, big projects that may not get funded. We might want to think about smaller projects that might score better. Um, and we'll, we'll work with Matt and, and the DOT to, to figure those things out as well. Matt, if I may, I have one question for you. Um, uh, there have been two tractor trailer accidents. Um, the intersection of Highway 64 and 15501 just this past autumn, just during the short period of time that I started really paying close attention to local affairs, local traffic, as I was in the campaign for this seat. Um, and it just so happens that from my traffic from here to our family farm in Silk Oak, I take that turn a lot. And it seems like it was improperly <coughs> Um It just feels like, even in a small SUV, that I have to be very careful not to turn over. So it's understandable to me that two tractor trailers have turned over at that intersection. It's very easy to get in the situation where you've got traffic coming southbound. You think, oh, I got to cut quick to get across before they come because it's not a protected stop line turn. It is a left turn. Um, but in thinking about their very small matter, because in the grand scheme it's small. In speaking with others about this, it occurred to me that we don't have what I think for our size or what we're going to be as we grow a larger town, a proper cloverleaf for on and off at each of those directions. Is that in the works? Um, I'm not aware of any plan to put in a, a cloverleaf at that, that location. I do know uh, there was a quarter study that was done on 15501 last year. And uh, that intersection there was part of the corridor study. I don't remember the specifics of what was recommended, but I don't believe they were looking at any new ramps. I think they were looking at things like signalization and turn lanes. Yeah. Right. Right. I can just second that. I was at a meeting with DOT last week. They're looking at the intersection signalization at that intersection, along with several more of the towards Northwood. It's dangerous up here in Northwood. Thank you. So I think as we uh, move beyond the, the endorsement of the 10 projects tonight, uh, we need to think more about transportation planning in the town. Um, and where we know that there are issues or where there's been accidents, let's note those because those might score better, I hate to say it, might score better because there's been accidents. Um, or they're just a small enough project that we might be able to get funded and move up the list. So um, at any point in time, uh, send me projects or areas of concern. I'll, I'll start a spreadsheet so when we're back at this next year, 
uh, we can look at that spreadsheet and maybe even sit around the table and, and draw on a map and, and, and have Matt involved and, and get some guidance from him on, on how do we bump up our projects to score better. Uh, we, we, we should do that. That's a fine idea. Yeah. I, I just have a lot of questions uh, and, and I think that would be very useful. Yeah. Um, but uh, if I may, I'll just plug you with a couple more. Okay. Or maybe Matt. Um, why is it that we would need a widening of those three lanes, two to three lanes at uh, 15501 from 87 to Robeson Street? Is it just the elementary school, excuse me, the middle school? It seems like there's not much commercial on that stretch. Um, so, uh, this is actually a uh, project idea that comes from sort of before I got involved in this. So this is something that's sort of been on the priority list for many, many cycles. Um, I, I can't speak as to what the original intent was, uh, but certainly the adding the third lane there does help to get the left turning traffic that's trying to get into the school, especially um, help to get that sort of out of the way so it's not impeding the other traffic. Um, you know, adding a, a third lane doesn't give you a huge boost in capacity, but it does help uh, with the flow. Um, it, it, that, that left turning traffic can really block things up, so. Matt, I have one question that maybe you could share with the board. Out of the 10 projects that we have here, what's your experience of which ones will be funded? Top two, top one, top four? Um, so this is always a dangerous yeah. uh, guess nobody's to make. Nobody's going to hold you to it. I'm just, I want you all to sort of get a feel for when we rank these, all of them don't get funded. And it may be just one or two of them that get funded. So um, when I looked at the DOT scores and I kind of did some analysis of what I think the minimum DOT score that you need in order to reasonably have a chance of being funded, uh, that score was a 25, and I'm looking to see how many, um, what's around a 25? So, um, <coughs> trying to find what the most Chatham project. So, there's an East 3rd Street sidewalk, so your number two project. So your top two there on the list are the ones that have a, a reasonable shot. The rest of them, um, you know, nothing's ever impossible, but I, I don't think it's likely that they would get funded. So I think that's important for us to know that even if we're number three and we feel good about that, it may not result in dollars being, being put on that project. Um, so we really have to advocate and make, good, make darn sure that our project scores well enough in the future that we can be one or two. One we know might always get funded unless something happens. Well, did the unfunded project carry over to they the do. next year? They do. So we well, could actually right. insert. So they, they change the rules every time, so we don't know for <laughs> sure. <laughs> but, but in the past they have. That's right. That's right. Randy Bowler? Yeah, I just wanted to address a question that Commissioner Bonnets had. So John, back when I was on that board, Represented the town, uh, and Matt, of course, served with me and Paul Black and Warren and Strong. The reason that that project came up, and it came from the, the county and folks in town back in 2005, was there was a desire to have bike lanes and sidewalks all the way from Horton, you know, that side of town, all the way to Powell Place. And so it's been a long slog. I think Pam's been on the board the entire time that this has been on the project list. That's why she's asking about the one going to a power place. So by train laning, it would also have widening sidewalks. It was intent to have bike lanes and sidewalks and be a boulevard the whole way through so that the south side of town got the same treatment as the north side and you would have bike lanes and sidewalks. That was the reason. At one time I thought that was pretty high. And then what happened to it? Where is it? It disappeared. Thank you. Thank you very much. My final question. I'm sorry. Uh, what is modernization of Pittsburgh Montgomery Road? Um, so, 
Modernization is essentially adding shoulders um, and making sure that the lanes are up to spec. It's really dangerous. Yeah. 80, 70 works. And I've got uh, one other question. Of the 10 projects, there is a column called TIP number. Yes. And none of them, but for 87, have a number assigned, which means to tell me it might have been something more important in the past. So I, I was able to dig as far back as 1996. And I can tell you that in 1996, that was a TIP project, which meant somebody <coughs> at some point in the past had gotten uh, had gotten that added to the state's funded project list. Now, the thing to understand is that in 2009, the entire system for how that list was developed changed. So prior to 2009, what you did was you put together your list of priorities, you went to the, your DOT board member, and they got your project added to the list. Um, since 2009, we have to go through this scoring system, and there are quite a few projects that were sort of legacy projects from that pre-2009 period that are still hanging out there with their TIP number, but they're not getting funded in the new system. Um, this is one of those. Um, I don't know what happened along the line as to why it didn't get built back in 1996. That's well before my time, but that's sort of the history there. So we've been talking about a project that we think is funded. We'd like to see the benefits of being constructed, and we think it's in 2019, right? So the the one on Hillsborough Street is funded. That one does not have to go through this right. process. So this project was funded in 1996, yep. and. Is, so how far out can it, can the funding be allocated for? So DOT allocates funds 10 years out into the future. If your project is within five years, which your Hillsborough Street project is, they consider that a committed project. They will not, they will, they've agreed that is committed, they're going to build it. The stuff that's in the five to 10 year period, that could change. So you need to get funded five years straight before you're committed? Uh, not necessarily, because there are opportunities if it's a small enough project and things can shift around, you, your project might end up in the first five years on its first try. It, it's possible. Thank you very much. Now, I believe we need a motion um, to accept and approve the 4.0 recommendation of ranking. <coughs> Is there a motion to be, to be made? So moved. And a second? Second. That fully made the motion. Pamela Baldwin seconded. Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you board. Much. Can I just ask one more quick question? Will these rankings stay the same number as they move along over the years, or do they get mixed or mixed up? Well, next year we'll be coming back and we'll, we'll okay. be ranked all different. Okay. Next item on the agenda is the payment for 1998 uh, Carolina Living and Learning Center wastewater lift station and force main upside. Thing. Brian Grisco. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I think we have the microphone here. In your packet this evening, I included some documents that uh, try to explain uh, an issue that uh, was a surprise to us, uh, or a surprise to me anyway, a few years ago. Uh, back in the late 90s, uh, the School of Medicine, uh, when they built the Carolina Living and Learning Center, uh, which is I think also known as, as locally as maybe the Autism Center, um, they built a facility, uh, it's kind of down at the bottom of that hill at Russet Run. Uh, at that point in time, uh, the uh, engineers determined that there needed to be a pump station or a lift station to get wastewater up that hill and then uh, essentially to the, to the town's treatment system um, and, uh, and to, serve, to, to serve that facility. Uh, at that point in time in negotiations, the town and uh, the School of Medicine uh, agreed that the town um, could uh, 
can upsize uh, the force main and the pump station uh, to accommodate future development. Um, the, uh, there, was, uh, there was some back and forth, and Mr. Messick is here and I think has some additional institutional and historical knowledge on, on the issue, and it's more than, I think, welcome to, to throw something at if I get off, off track here. But, uh, but essentially, um, the cost of puff sizing the lift station was eventually agreed to be, uh, I think we have a breakdown in one of the, in one of the handouts here eventually agreed to be $88,650 based on uh, based on the cost you see outlined here. Um, there was a memo that, um, that Mr. Messick had uh, Mr. Messick had put together. It's also in your packet. Um, I don't have it up right now. But uh, the memo basically spells out the basically spells out the agreement um, in terms of the town uh, agreeing to reimburse <coughs> the university for the cost of upsizing uh, those facilities. Now again, back in 1998 dollars, the amount was $88,650. Uh, the, the project was built. Um, both the town and the university have enjoyed uh, the services since then. Uh, however, in the meantime, uh, two things did not happen. Uh, one was that the uh, easement with, that, uh, that the lift station uh, currently sits on, which if you go down to the bottom of Russet Run, you can see a fenced in area where the pump station is located, that essentially um, technically sits on university property. Um, in order to grant the easement for that lift station um, and the force main moving out of it, um, the property division or the property office at UNC uh, has agreed that the uh, that as long as the cost of upsizing the facilities as determined back in 1998 is paid by the town, then they would, uh, they would then uh, release the, uh, the easement for uh, the force main and the lift station. Um, also too with the payment of an additional $1 in consideration. The, uh, the actual, um, the actual, Actual easement is also uh, easement document is and also provided by the state's attorney general uh, and is and is in your packet. Uh, the currently the document is unsigned. Uh, if you were to agree tonight to uh, to reimburse the university for the cost of the upsize, um, staff would then prepare a budget amendment that would, um, that would create uh, a transfer from the town's. Uh, from the town's capital reserves uh, to pay uh, to pay the easement, uh, write a letter of agreement in turn to the university saying the town agrees to pay the easement, cut the check, uh, submit the check to the university, and then the university would then in turn process this document through uh, the state of North Carolina. Uh, somewhat of a slow moving process, um, the, uh, and does take a, a little bit of doing. Um, the, uh, I know Mr. Rose from, from Preston Development has helped uh, staff a little bit. Uh, Mr. Messick, of course, and the town engineer. Uh, Fred Royal and myself have also been working on it uh, over the last year and a half, almost two years now. Uh, the, uh, I believe I updated the board briefly on it at one point in time. Uh, I think we've got everything uh, in a row now at this point. And uh, should you should you agree, then we will uh, we will move forward with uh, with wrapping this uh, long-standing item up and uh, getting out of the lives. So with that, I'd open it for any questions. Or <coughs> questions for Mr. Breesbeck. Yeah. Mr. Breesbeck. Yeah. Mr. Breesbeck. Yeah. Mr. Breesbeck. Yeah. Uh, in the memo, it talks about the various iterations of engineering. Um, and that the pump station was first designed at a lower gallons per minute, but then upsized. Can we confirm that the pump station was built to that spec? Do we know that? I got a nod. Fred is not. Well, Fred, okay. And is there a six inch force main that's in the ground? Do we know that too? I can't recall. It's been a year and a half. I think I'm about to look. Yeah. 
would like to. It was it was designed for the full build out of the entire sewer shed. So the, okay, that's the next question. Yeah. So it's designed to accommodate so the entire six. basin. And it's a six on fifty by one. Okay. So probably a six all the way back to the bottom. Um, and do we still think that the pump station is adequate for the full basin build out? Because Chatham Park has come along. And I don't know if the previous zoning would have allowed for a greater density or land use plan perhaps identified a greater density. Well, I think I think the, the pump station is one issue. The size of the size of the actual force made in the ground is another issue. I know that Fred uh, Fred has talked about upsizing again the the force main, or excuse me, the, the actual line, the, the force main that's currently in the ground. And so that's a possibility, but under the terms of this agreement, um, it kind of is what it is right now. Uh, I think what you're talking about is is looking at, um, you know, they're, they're planning issues really on another track and maybe a discussion for the very near future. Mm -hmm. But as far as the deal that we have right now, uh, but we feel that we did get the pump station and the six inch force main that was part of this agreement. Yeah, we're pretty confident after this time that, the, that those things are in place and have been operating since you know, the late 90s. And 18 years pretty much, but other than that. Yeah. <laughs> Any further questions? 18 years free money, and they've been uh, paying for maintenance and operation? No. The town has treated this as if it was okay. And we've never been denied access to any of the facilities, nor I don't, I, I, I question as to whether or not we ever would be able to be denied access to those facilities. But, but this, this essentially formalizes a, a long standing operational arrangement. And when development occurs, there will be the collection of capital recovery fees that is designed specifically for these kinds of expenses. Yeah, you could argue that you could argue that we've already been collecting those yeah. recovery fees, which go to pay for this upside, but not for this specific project. General projects, but not this one in specific. Well, we have been allocated, but I guess we're now going to allocate it towards this specific project. Not for this particular drainage basin. So you could do it on that basis as well. Because this is only going to serve a certain defined area. Right, and for all those users in that area, they will be uh, charged a capital recovery the fee. The same capital recovery fee that everybody is charged. Right. Further right. okay. questions? Is there a motion to authorize the town manager to prepare a budget amendment? To upsize the wastewater enforcement in the lift station. So moved. moved by Michael Fiocco, seconded by John Bonnet. Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Well, we've done some housework tonight then. The next on our agenda is the manager's update on project. Brian Grusman. Thank you again, Madam Mayor. I will. Uh, one item in particular with regards to the, the very first very first piece that we would begin with would be the, uh, on, on my memo, would be the additional elements. And I think Jeff, if you want to talk at all about that, I think as of right now, we do not have, uh, we do not have a copy of the additional elements submitted. Um, we have, um, have been informed that uh, we can still anticipate those. Uh, as far as staff is concerned, we're ready to uh, ready to review and ready to outline a process for review uh, uh, in the very near future. Um, Unified Development Ordinance uh, has been moving along. Um, you guys have been very active in that. Uh, the uh, second joint meeting was held back uh, back on the 18th. Um, Mr. Walden will be from Clarion will be assimilating the notes and uh, producing a document for review and comment. Um, the, uh, Mr. Jones, town planner, will be scheduling a public review session upon completion of the module. And I don't know that we've decided on a format for that yet. Not yet. Um, 
but uh, a good time, a uh, good informative time will be had by all. Um, Jeff has promised that. Downtown vision plan, traffic circle, uh, as mentioned previously, we've, we've uh, had, a, had a meeting on that on, on April 12th. Uh, at 6.30 p.m. It was, it was fairly well attended. Uh, there is, uh, it was also attended by uh, Mr. Royal, town engineer, um, to talk about how the coordination of stormwater controls and the design on the northeast, to, forgive me, corner of the circle uh, could be accommodated. Um, I know those, those uh, the coordination of those improvements, at least by what Mr. Royal has indicated, sound favorable. I don't know if you have any additional comments. Working on the details right now. So that uh, that proceeds, and we'll we'll have more information uh, on that as we move forward. Town hall offices. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some improvements that, uh, that we'd like to make internally. They are relatively minor, but the place will look uh, a little bit different. Um, the uh, up on our screen right now, you can see. I don't know. Let me enlarge this just a little bit. This is currently the uh, this is the uh, the old uh, floor plan uh, for the uh, for the town hall. I'm going to direct your attention over here uh, to this is the area that was originally identified as the break room, and this is this is where the glass uh, sort of the glass block windows are. My desk is located right here. Previous to that, Stuart was in it. Um, not so long ago, it was still a break room. Uh, but I think when we hired Mr. Bass uh, for my time, uh, he moved in here. And then when planning moved its offices over to Fayetteville Street, um, I took that office. And then we just sort of shifted and gave the finance officer uh, a bigger office as well. If you want to see the complete plans, I, I, I have them. But I want to focus just on this area for now. Um, the original area, this, this area right here, which now which currently contains our refrigerator and our sink and our vending area and the time clock, Labeled this vending uh, is more or less what it is. Uh, it's remains what it is now. Um, so this is this is. Uh, if we go over over here, just slide over here. We have we have this area being the boardroom. This area, this room right here, which is labeled copy room. Uh, you might remember when Paul Horn uh, was was located in town hall. His office was right here, so just over here. Uh, Currently, we're using that for storage. It has Paul's old desk in it. Um, what, uh, what we want to do, given some of our earlier discussions about uh, need for more space and uh, need for more storage area um, and uh, need to kind of rehab our evidence storage and things of that nature would be to um, allow me to move out of this room right here, uh, move a couple of officers in here. We would move me into this area, but with a little bit of modification um, that would look something. This is a highly, highly engineered drawing that I've got going here. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see, you can see where all I literally did was erase a couple of lines. I would be taking out the wall that was right here and right here, and. The, the door back in that corner of the room is a closet, and so I would be knocking out the room, to the, knocking out the wall to the break room, knocking out this wall to the closet, um, and then knocking out this wall, and essentially just creating a little bit larger space. No windows, but windows distract me anyway. So, um, so I would I would be moving in here. We would have some sort of desk arrangement in here, and possibly around here. Uh, and then we would, that would allow us to move some of the officers that are located over here, over to here, and then we would be able to, and uh, Percy hasn't gone over how we would store, or we haven't really firmly decided on uh, how we would be changing the evidentiary storage uh, at this point, other than currently our evidence room, which is located here where it says uh, communications, is also in the same room, the house is our, um, our phone bank technology and our power switch, which means that every time, uh, every time someone has to work on uh, the phone system or someone has to do something with uh, with our fuse boxes or our powers or our circuits, we have to track this person down right here. Is the only Troy Robertson, Lieutenant Robertson, 
it's the only person that has the key to that room in the entire town because and that's by design because obviously we want to limit the restrict we want to limit access to our evidence um, obvious reasons that so we want to you know, we want to move we want to move that to uh, this location over here but personally you know, I haven't really worked out I don't know if you know more yeah. about that. Mm -hmm. the only other thing that we would be working on um, would be if we go over to this area now even the lobby area looks different than than what we have right here. Um, we currently have we currently have walls in right here and right here, and we have a payments clerk right here. This is the area that Mayor Perry is uh, is holding uh, is holding some some meetings and, and has been uh, enjoying this little space right here um, and, and is here I believe on Mondays. Um, so these these walls are in place. They don't show up on the drawing. But what we would be doing is and there's a there's a sort of a bar half wall area right here. We would be modifying this to allow access from the lobby to this door, limited access. We would we would have to buzz people through or escort them through. But the idea being that we wouldn't have that we would be taking people from who are now coming to the rear of the building. They're coming into the rear of the building or they're coming in through the lobby um, and they're coming in through the lobby and uh, around my, and then coming through this way over here and then into the police station for meetings with the police department. And this is problematic only because our, our network servers in this area, our vault and our mail areas in this area, we've got a couple of shelves that people usually bump their heads out if they're not looking. Um, so we want to take this movement out of our daily operations and to the extent that it's necessary to escort people through here, open this area up, and we're actually we're actually anticipating that um, relatively minor change to happen this week. So, um, so again, I would vacate my current office. This would be place for for police officers. For the, you know, Paul Horn's old office. I would move in there. We would knock walls down, make it a little bit bigger, um, and then. Uh, and then, and then move us around um, the storage. We, I think, use this also as an opportunity to take a look at and take a look at uh, what things we need that we're currently storing, which can either be moved off-site to different dry storage, or uh, or destroyed uh, as allowable, uh, if allowable by law. In certain cases, and we've noticed that we have quite a few bank boxes with with outdated information that can can, can be shredded. So we. We've looked at uh, some firms to uh, help us dispose of that information properly and, uh, and free up a little bit more space on, on that account. So, again, con continuing the conversation we had earlier uh, about space, and I think uh, making sure that we can at least get through uh, for uh, at least uh, a couple more years until we've, we've made a firm decision on what we're doing with the larger issue of how administra administrative space is, is arranged. Um, we've, we've Come, come at this plan, I think, for uh, for an amount under four thousand dollars, which we can fit under our, our in our current budget. Um, the, the estimate was actually at thirty-two, so we're padding it uh, through two hundred dollars. So we're, we're padding it a little bit. Um, so I will keep you uh, I will keep you posted on that. If you guys have any comments, questions, concerns as we go along, uh, please feel free to let me know. But hopefully, uh, this gets us a little bit closer to. Keeping us operationally efficient and, and legal, um, you know, as we figure out what we want to do in the space in the future. And, uh, with that, I would uh, tap out and uh, open for any other comments, questions, concerns that uh, you guys want to have. Thank you very much. Questions for Brian Griffin? Okay. Thank and um, do we have, have sorry. I do have some questions, but not on any of these items. Um, but I don't want to jump. If anybody's got a, got a question. question on a couple of the items. Um, yeah, Fred, you say you're working on the details, so it sounds like the design's pretty well in hand. And are you coordinating with Kimberly Horn so that they have yes. the benefit of that design? Yes. Okay, excellent. Great, thanks. And the, land, the, uh, the uh, owner of the Blair building. No. Okay. Gotcha. Um, one other thing about the UDO, um, I think we had a great meeting 
this last go, go around. The discussion was fantastic. Played with lots of members of the planning board, um, and I discussed what a quality session it was and how we thought there was plenty more material to go through. And I emailed back and forth with Jeff a couple of times, and I thought he came up with a great idea. And I'd like to know if we can follow through with it, because I would definitely endorse it. And that is having a get-together, the two-hour get-together, same group, public come in as well, um, every third Monday of every third Monday. And, and I put it out there for the foreseeable future, because we're going to have UDO and Channel Parks and those that uh, could benefit from both boards having some time to discuss instead yeah. of having to react at a, at a normal meeting. Uh, I have not discussed it with Plan 1. I intend to do that next week. Yeah. Uh, I want to get here. I, I thought you might bring it up tonight, so I want yeah. to hear some feedback from, from the town board on, on thoughts on that. Well, I, I wholeheartedly endorse that. I think it's a very good idea whether you know, Roger can attend or not. Oh, and I, and I don't think he might. I right. think it would just be us. Yep. And, and hearing from me, to him. or hearing from Fred, if we need to bring Fred in on, on a particular item, or Paul, the parks, or something like that. Just for a time for us to get together with the two boards and have a have good discussion on on planning efforts uh, in the town. Yep. So I'll just be designated as planning session. Uh, just to like a work session. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, and we could craft the the, the language of notice, how public notice of how we do that. Um, and I don't know if we would give it any more structure because we did kind of meander through the document, but that, quite frankly, might be the best way to do it because yeah. one thing leads to another, and what about this idea? Yeah, and, and as we go through it, and and I need more pointed discussions on certain. Topics. Um, I'm not, I don't know what that might be at the moment. I would have an agenda prepared for that meeting. Say, I need to have discussion on this element of Jadon Park because I need to be able to react to that uh, um, or what have you. And I think it's good that if we have an agenda, we can let the public know what we're talking about, mm -hmm. not just planning related items. But that's a little more broad. So we would. We would, at the moment, be talking about UDO. In the future, we'd be talking, we could be talking about the UDO and or Chatham Park. I really felt like our discussions, and then we feel like we went off track. I felt like there were all important discussions, and I felt like all of it was productive, but I didn't feel like that's a good Certainly, it would be left open to, to all board members to come, but understandably, if someone could <coughs> take that third Monday, Every so often or so would be understanding. So we'll I say too how great it was to work with the planning board. You know, just feeling like we're on the same team. Yeah. It's really great to get to know yeah. them better. Yeah. I, I think in particular our discussion about the arts and and the way we worked through at times you had to sort of herd the cats that were involved in that discussion, but but it was still I thought it was a really vibrant discussion. I think it's really important that we continue with that because we do exchange a lot of ideas yeah. and things which we might not think about, the planning board thinks about it, something that planning board may not think about, we may think about. So we can interact and exchange ideas and this with the UDO, the last two were great. So it's a great idea. Good. I'll, I'll bring it up at next Monday's meeting and we'll go to the air. And if it's a go, then I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, work with Alice to schedule that. Thanks for the idea. Yeah. We have one last agenda item, which is the finance officer summary report for the fiscal year through March 31st. Um, is Heather, Heather Meacham, our finance director, here Good evening. Um, I'm going to keep this short and sweet. So I just want to highlight some of the, um, the areas that I noticed um, compared to last year, and then also just sort of the areas where our year to date. Um, we are over 100%. So um, two revenue areas um, where we're over 100% year-to-date already are our motor vehicle and the Powell bill. And the Powell bill, I mean, that's money. We were the same last year at this time. 
we just we budget 120,000, and it looks like last year we we received 124,000 as well, um, give or take a few hundred. So those are two revenue areas. Um, in the general fund, where we're over 100 percent, we are also over 100 percent on two expenditure areas. Um, however, the transfers to capital projects that is for the pocket park project and we will be making um, we actually have funds in another account that we need to from the donations that were not moved with the last budget amendment so we will be making another amendment to that and we will be fine so um, and that project is complete um, and then the legal is currently over um, year to date so we are looking to get some reimbursements for those fees so then we will be back um, under 100%. So there's no budget concerns with those areas. Um, and then I just wanted to compare to last year our property taxes. Um, year to date, last year we were at the same time we were um, at 94%, and so this year we're already at 96%. So we're doing a little bit better there on collections. Um, and then our water and sewer fund, we are higher on our. Um, on our late fees and penalties than we were last year in terms of year-to-date collected. Um, and I think that's mostly due to our fees had increased from the last year. So, but please let me know if you have any questions. And also you don't have to ask me questions tonight. If you don't want to, you're welcome to stop by my office anytime. So. Any questions for Heather Major? Thank you, Heather. We're now at Commissioner Concerns. Mr. Bonas, would this uh, be a good time for your, sure. for your question or input? Um, Brian, Mayor Bruce, uh, Manager Bruceback, um, curious about the status of the RFQ for the financial advisor. I'm sorry I've been out of pocket, but uh, last I understood you were going to receive we've received proposals for evaluating them. We'll have a recommendation shortly. Okay. Um, and, and you went out for you you held out for a little bit more proposals, I think. Yeah, I, I received one additional proposal. Good. Um, can you share a brief highlight of the role of this whatever firm it would be that you would expect from from this contract? Well, as I indicated in the previous materials and discussion. The, uh, the, there would be assistance on a gamut of, of projects dealing not only with future <coughs> development but current operations. Uh, our revenue structures, uh, um, the, uh, also to assistance in, in terms of uh, any future bonding that would be necessary, uh, development agreements. Um, uh, essentially, we were looking for a full-service financial advisory firm that, that had experience with you know, with development, uh, but also uh, current operations. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, interesting to hear uh, from Heather that uh, late fees and penalties are, are up uh, as a revenue stream, and that um, that's something I did hear from the constituent about, as you know, and um, I'm I was a surprise to me that uh, there was such a significant increase in those fees, the late fees, the penalties for reconnect. Um, I guess I'm fortunate that I've been able to pay that bill automatically, and I've never had cause to know that there were significant penalties for uh, not payment and, and then having it reconnected. So I'm wondering if. Um, I'm wondering if other commissioners are aware of the pretty stiff nature of those fees, um, because it kind of feels to me like if somebody's not able to pay their bill and then we hit them with a really dramatic fee, um, it goes beyond a deterrent effect and it really um, becomes a punitive measure on folks who are least capable of paying their water bill. I'm not saying that we should allow them to string along, but um, I wasn't privy to the discussion in the prior board when this decision was made. 
mean, <coughs> the board did have discussion during the last budgeting process and, and, and elected through the budget ordinance to increase uh, increase penalties and fees uh, mm -hmm. compared to the previous year. Mm -hmm. And they are what at this point? Is it a percentage of the? Um, so you get a late fee of 10 percent of five dollars if you balance less than 50 if it's past the 20th of the month. Of the month. So you don't pay on it, it's still on the 20th. Um, and then we have a reconnection fee of 45 dollars. So if you don't pay by the end of the month, you have a balance on the first of the month, then you're liable to be, your service is cut off. And those fees are very comparable to other towns. So I think the big jump was because we weren't we had left it for a while, and then but we are in line with the fees that other towns charge, and even some of our fees are still lower than you know. Than so if someone is having trouble paying their bill, what's our policy about working with them? Can they make payments, or do we have any? any uh, I mean, we do try to, but but we don't. I mean, that's not our current our current policy. I mean, we don't have a. Yeah. A set policy for payment plans or anything like that, um, but that's I mean, definitely something that we can. <coughs> maybe that would address your concern, John, that they have some alternative for someone who's just having trouble coming up with money. Yeah, this this constituent made a payment, but it was apparently an inadequate payment to um, because it didn't. She wasn't even aware of the late fees had added on. Mm -hmm. So in her mind, she made the complete payment, but she hadn't according to our accounts. And that resulted in a disconnect. <coughs> so she feels like she's making progress and still got disconnected. Mm -hmm. um, situations like that. Uh, <coughs> it's very reasonable in my perception in her um, communication of the problem. And she suggested Perhaps this is simply an information management issue where our accounting system um, could take note of received payments after uh, a past due bill has been has gone out mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, address that action appropriately. Perhaps defer that period of disconnect if a payment has been made. Right, and so that would be a change also in our policy. I mean, not just in noting it in the account. So, I mean, that would be something that we would have to discuss further. Mm -hmm. um, but, and we are, right now, we are serving some other towns in terms of, um, you know, fees and stuff like that and different fee structures because we just have the, the two different, we have like the late payment, you know, the penalty for late payment or for non payment, and then the essentially the cutoff. Mm -hmm. so. And where do we stand on uh, improving our transaction friendliness with regard to different forms of payment acceptance? Um, that's something I mean that I'm I'm researching <coughs> where it was sort of left off and um, and we're um, I mean something Great. definitely on the top of the Great. priority list. So. That'd be really good to, to pin down. Mm -hmm. All right. Are there other? Other matters? Um, I'm tempted to ask um, about Jay's uh, question from last month about uh, where we stand with regard to some of these properties that are uh, not occupied and, and not helping the town. I think we talked about addressing things through the media. We did. Um, I also drafted a letter uh, uh, to those property owners who own uh, abandoned properties on Hillsborough Street and uh, uh, ran it by uh, Brian Greenbeck and uh, Paul Messick. And I think we're making some degree of progress with respect to notifying them that, that this will not be, uh, that we'd just like to know their plans. And that if their plans are not such that something will be brought into compliance, that we are going to be working through the UDO to get a more efficient structure to deal with abandoned properties. So I think it's somewhat in the works. That's great to know. Uh, 
others. Jerry Farrell. Um, I just have one. I had several uh, citizens in town uh, that came to me recently about the Thompson Street, the traffic that is, if you come up Thompson Street, if there's any possibility of uh, having a no left turn put in there, either Monday through Friday or maybe just certain times of the day, the traffic really gets backed up back down Thompson Street when you got one or two cars wanting to make a left hand turn. I don't know how many we can do Yes, uh, right at Elizabeth's Pizza there. <coughs> if we can just keep that straighter, either right hand turn only. I always judge a light because I know how congested it can be. I don't know if we have to go through DOT for that, being a city street. Folks can use the light, go a block over and use the light. I do. Yeah, I hate to have a rule that says they can't turn left in the damn Well, I too had a Thompson Street complaint this past uh, couple weeks, except it dealt with uh, speeding on Thompson Street. And as we begin to develop the Lillian Academy property and build out uh, uh, Chatham Park issues there on Thompson Street. I know we're going to be looking at some major improvements there, but I uh, mentioned it to Chief Percy Crutchfield, and, and there were cars, uh, police cars, patrolling more frequently, I noticed, on, uh, on Thompson Street. So public beware. Um, <laughs> so. Thank you. Uh, uh, two things. Um, there was a post by some uh, citizens who are complaining about the pavement condition on Pittsburgh Elementary School Road, where it takes a 90 degree turn. I've, I've gone by and there are some potholes and it's pretty rough through there. So I looked uh, for our document about the pavement assessment um, and, I, and I did not find in the document that I have a list of improvements, so maybe I'm missing. Doesn't matter. I mean, if if something, if it's a situation where we do notice severe degradation, pavement somewhere, you know, we're not we're not shackled on by the list. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Well, I'd like to just uh, put that on the list. Let me go take a look at that and see if it was sure. correction. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to talk about is what uh, Heather brought up um, today, uh, earlier in the meeting about the 4th of July need for $1,100. Um, I would like for, in cooperation with the PBA and the Main Street program, to see if we've got that in the budget. The $1,100 is not an issue. Okay. It's not, it, it's not an issue. <coughs> the, I, mean, I, I in no way, shape, or form have ever represented it as being an issue as far as payment goes. I, I think, I think <coughs> Chief Crutchfield and myself have been clear with, with Heather and with a couple of the others that she's dealt with on the matter. On a July 3rd weekend, uh, on the July 3rd weekend, it's probably the busiest vacation weekend of the year for police officers. What's needed, according to Chief Crutchfield's estimation, to close off 15501, a state highway, is 12 officers to manage the roadblocks over a seven hour period, which is what she's asking for. At thirty dollars an hour, um, that you know that, that I forget what it, you know, the amount is. I think it was up over five thousand dollars, and Chatham Park gracefully um, agreed to cover a portion of that. Um, but the eleven the eleven hundred dollars isn't really so much the challenge as finding twelve able-bodied officers to um, to staff the barricades and, and to you know assist traffic and pedestrians in, in and around the area. Uh, of course, we have uh, we have 13 or 14 total officers uh, in our department, and obviously, even if we deployed all of them on a July 3rd weekend, paying them overtime, uh, you know, we don't we don't have enough. So we, we're kind of at the mercy of, of area departments and what we can bring in. So that that's the bigger challenge there. And I haven't I haven't committed, you know, to to guaranteeing uh, to guaranteeing that until more about who's available. So she had mentioned, I think, three hours or 
members that weren't part of the program at this point? Did she say that? She said three hours that she's needing to cover. Yeah. So I don't understand. I thought they could maybe find officers in some of the smaller towns. Like I guess that the larger set towns would be using their police departments. Yeah, I don't. Like I just. I, I just sometimes I have to be the guy that shares bad news, and the, the bad news on that weekend is, is a lot of people take time off. Right. Right. No, I, I understand completely. Uh, otherwise, we 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 will continue to be supportive of the downtown, and continue to contribute money and staff time to downtown, just like we did this past weekend. So, would the TPA be responsible for locating those police officers? I'm not sure what the TPA is responsible for, actually. I mean, it's so it's it's uh, the the the. the the other, the other missing piece on this, the other unknown, is the DOT has to actually approve the application. And, um, you know, so so in, as part of that application, they would be they would be looking at um, our traffic management plan, uh, routing traffic around the downtown area and making sure everything moves safely, um, and uh, you know, covering any of that in contingency. And I don't think the PBA is equipped to do that. That's going to be on the tower. Well, I appreciate you working with them, and it um, sounds like we don't have a financial issue if we can get the forces um, to the table. And so I appreciate you working with PBA. It's an important uh, group to be working with and part of the mainstream program. What was the times on that uh, street closing? They have requested 2 p.m. to 9 p.m., okay. which is longer than anything we've done. Yeah. Well, I, I gave them two other options. I, I suggested I suggested a shorter time frame, uh, which would obviously be less expensive, and I suggested something similar to what we do with the uh, street fair, which doesn't require any DOT participation and would reduce 12 officers down to two or three. Uh, but I think if you attended the Northwood event that was held over by the courthouse, that, that was smooth. <coughs> I think I think they're seeing a value. The PBA is seeing a value in trying to get the event uh, on the front door uh, of assuming those businesses are open. But they're trying to get them on the, the event uh, to the front door of the, the businesses in the downtown area, um, as opposed to just off the street areas. For what that's worth. Just a few things that there was complaint from the downtown business. It was the downtown business. Well, my, my gut is that if, if the street were closed, that there would be more traffic, more foot traffic, I mean, and more more people spending more money in downtown. But as a business owner, Jay, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, we closed the trails, I mean, anyway, but uh, I like, but like Mr. Krupek said, I think he said on Shadow Street this weekend was an excellent, <coughs> excellent place. That's in your room, people wait for the street, the street and still get this down. Businesses are open. They are open all Sunday. We don't have that many open all Sunday. So. Well, this is first Sunday, so I think uh, they're more open than yeah than when they're. Yeah. 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 Yeah.